All right, guys, welcome back. Um, we're going to do a practice lab exam for the Anatomy and Physiology 1 lab exam or lab practical on the brain and spinal cord. So we'll go through all different types of pictures and models and you'll see different um, questions that you can expect. And this is for the AMP one um, that's online. So we're taking this exam via pictures, but the pictures are literally of the models. So these are the same models that you would see um, in person. It's just that you would be looking at it right in front of you instead of a picture of it. Okay, so here we see a model that's showing us the ventricles of the brain. So the open spaces that are inside the brain. This is like, it's like molten plastic. So it's like if, if you poured melted plastic into the open spaces and then let it harden, this is showing you the shape of all of the open spaces inside the brain. These are the spaces where cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, flows through. So there are multiple ventricles, there are four ventricles, and then there are little passageways that connect the ventricles. Um, <clears throat> so for example, you see like this lateral ventricle on this side, and then on the opposite sides, another lateral ventricle. You see the third ventricle in the middle, and then you see the fourth ventricle at the very bottom. So two lateral ventricles, right? The third ventricle in the middle, and then fourth ventricle at the bottom then there are just the little connectors that connect them all to each other. And that's what this um, question is asking. Identify the structure or passageway at the tip of the arrow. So at the tip of the arrow is this little connection right here that goes from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle. Um, that little connection right there, the answer to this question would be interventricular foramen. A foramen or foramen is a hole, right? And interventricular is between the ventricles. This is literally a hole between the ventricles. It's a little connection um, so that the cerebrospinal fluid can flow from the lateral ventricle down through this foramen and into the third ventricle. So the answer to this would be interventricular foramen. This is the same model. We're just looking at it from the back. We're looking at a posterior view of this. So again, on the sides, you see your lateral ventricles. You can't really see the third ventricle very well, but it's right there in the middle. And then at the bottom here, you see the fourth ventricle. So what this question is pointing to is this long, thin tube or long, thin passageway that connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle so that the cerebrospinal fluid can flow down to the fourth ventricle. Um, this, the long thin tube, um, or the answer to this question, is the cerebral aqueduct. You can think aqueduct, like a duct for water. Um, cerebrospinal fluid is mainly water um, with dissolved solutes. So it's a duct for water and cerebral, right? Referring to the cerebrum, the brain. Um, so cerebral aqueduct. And I'll show you, we also see these structures on some other models as well. So you'll see like a couple different ways that the question could be asked. We've mentioned this a couple times. This should be pretty easy for you to look at this and say that the answer to that is the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle, that's the one that's between the cerebellum and the brainstem. Um, identify the structure indicated by the bracket. Oh, in the exam, it's blue. Um, <clears throat> when I copied everything to this PowerPoint, um, it automatically changed all of the colors, like the arrows and the brackets and the circles to green because there's green at the bottom of this. So just ignore blue. I do know what color. Um, blue is versus green. Um, so sorry about that. Anyhow, um, identify this structure. This again is one of the ventricles. This is the lateral ventricle. Okay, the lateral ventricle, this whole thing like this, 
with this horn back here. That's all one lateral ventricle. And then again, there's one on the other side. All right, so um, moving on. This is showing us a motor neuron, okay, or the, the cell body of a motor neuron. Um, a motor neuron is a really common type of neuron. That happens to be the type of neuron that stimulates um, skeletal muscle cells to contract. Um, <clears throat> this is showing us, again, the cell body or the main part of the neuron, and then um, the very beginning of the axon. So like the axon would stretch out this way and continue all the way down to the target cell. But we can see the majority of like the body of the neuron here. Um, <clears throat> neurons have processes sticking off of them, right? Um, and different neurons have a different number of processes. This is a motor neuron, so it has a lot of processes, right? It, it's got a lot of like branches coming off of it. Um, <clears throat> when we look at these branches, the majority of the branches are dendrites. Okay? And then there's one single long axon. So I just told you guys that this, this one right here is the axon. That means that all of these other branches, right? So all of these little gray ones, all of these gray branches here that are coming off of this cell body, all of those are dendrites. So the answer to this question would be dendrite. Remember, that's where neurons receive messages. So there's signals that are coming in to this neuron via the dendrites. Um, and that's actually what you see right here at the bottom, this area that I'm circling, that shows you another neuron uh, sending a message to this dendrite. Uh, this little kind of rubbery thing that you see here, that's the very end of the axon from a different neuron. Um, <clears throat> So it's giving a message to this neuron here. All the signals are coming in via these dendrites. And then if this neuron wants to send a signal out, it sends the signal out via the axon. Okay, but this question here is telling us a dendrite. And we could point to any of these gray ones, right? Again, all of these little gray ones that I've circled, we could point to any of those and they would be dendrites. Okay, any of the gray ones. Um, <clears throat> speaking of, this is pointing to um, one of these little rubbery things. These, again, are the very, very ends of a different neuron. Um, so we said that this axon is the way that the neuron sends a message. Well, the axon is going to go out, you know, far, and then it'll branch, you know, maybe once, maybe a lot of times. And then at the very end of all of the branches, it has this little swollen knob. And that's what you see here. All of these little rubbery things, you see the very end of the axon, and then you see this little swollen area at the very, very end of it. Um, <clears throat> so I could point to, you know, this one down here too, and I would be asking you the same thing. That is the synaptic terminal. the synaptic terminal, um, or you could call it a terminal bouton. A terminal bouton. Um, <clears throat> synaptic terminal is what I refer to it as. It's the, the terminal part of the neuron, the very end of that, that neuron, where it forms a synapse with another cell, right? Where it's gonna release a neurotransmitter to another cell. Okay, um, again, I could point out this one too, right? That's another um, synaptic terminal from another neuron. <clears throat> this is pointing to the area at the very beginning of the axon. Okay, so you'll notice that it kind of like, it's kind of funnel shaped, right? It, it's really wide at the base and then it gets thinner and thinner and thinner as it leads out to the axon. This part in the very beginning here, it's colored kind of like peach color. This part in the very beginning is called the axon hillock. The axon hillock. It's the beginning of the axon. Um, then this, hopefully you look at this and really easily you know what this is pointing to. 
um, this is pointing to the axon. And again, that's where the message is going to be sent um, down to whatever target cell. Okay, so <clears throat> same model. Um, identify the area indicated by the red bracket. So this is just asking us, like, what is this general area, right? This, this general area of the neuron. And that's the cell body, or you could call it the soma. Soma literally means body. Um, so the cell body or the soma. This is just the general region of the um, neuron where like the nucleus is located, where all of the dendrites are coming in, where the beginning of the axon is. That's the main part of the neuron or the cell body. Um, <clears throat> now, this question could be phrased a little bit differently. Um, if this question, say, had an arrow that went like this and it said, identify the structure right at the tip of the arrow or if the bracket was a little bit smaller and it was just indicating the circle in the middle and it said identify this structure then i would say the nucleus right because this ball in the middle is the nucleus um, of this neuron but just the way that the question's phrased identify the area and it's going a little bit wider than that nucleus that leads me to believe that um, this would be cell body or soma Okay, so what we're looking at here is a continuation of the axon. So remember, it's like we have our cell body with all of the dendrites, with all of the dendrites that are like coming in. And then we have our axon hillock leading to the axon. And we have this long axon. And it can branch, but ultimately at the end, we end up having this like synaptic terminal um <clears throat> so this is just showing us like one segment like that of one segment of the axon what this is pointing to um, what this question is asking for is the structure at the tip of the arrow so it's pointing to this right this structure that goes down the very center that is the axon okay again that's the actual axon You'll notice that the axon has all this stuff wrapped around it, right? So like all of this, this white that you see outside of the axon, um, or when it's sectioned, when it's opened, you can see that there's numerous layers to it. That's not the actual axon. Um, that's the myelination, right? That myelin sheath that gets wrapped around the axon. We'll look at it on another picture in a second. The axon itself is this, um, this thin part that goes right down the center. Um, identify the structure at the tip of the arrow. So this is pointing specifically to this right here. Um, and that's a nucleus. That's the nucleus of a cell. Um, it's the nucleus of the cell that actually forms this myelin sheath. Okay, so there are cells that um, stretch out their membranes and wrap their membranes around and around and around the axon. Um, this is the nucleus of the cell. Those cells are con called Schwann cells, so SCH, Schwann cell nucleus. Um, <clears throat> identify the substance at the tip of the arrow. You guys will see I try and like give you clues in the question what it is that I'm actually asking for. Um, so identify the substance at the tip of the arrow, the yellow wrapping. Okay, so you know it's not the axon. I'm asking you for the wrapping that goes around the axon. Um, and you know it's not the cell. We just an answered the cell, right? Schwann cell nucleus. This is just the yellow wrapping. And you can see the layers, right? You can see how this wrapping just goes around and around and around and around the axon. Um, <clears throat> that wrapping around the axon that gives it insulation is called the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath. 
And remember that um, the reason we myelinate axons, the reason we wrap this myelin sheath around them is to speed up the action potential. Um, the action potential is the electrical signal that goes down the axon. Like, so when the neuron sends a message down the axon, that message goes faster if there's a myelin sheath present, if there's that insulation around the axon. Um, identify the arrow at the tip, or identify the area at the tip of the arrow. So I'm asking for the area. Don't answer myelin sheath. Um, this is actually an area where there's no myelin sheath. It's a gap in the myelin sheath. Um, but I'm specifically asking you for an area. When we look at axons that are myelinated, um, the entire axon does not get myelated. Myelinated. It's not a complete covering around everything. There are tiny little gaps in myelination. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see like that this section is myelinated, then there's a little tiny gap. Then this section is myelinated, then there'll be a little tiny gap. Um, everywhere that you see it gets a little bit thinner, those are the gaps where there's no myelination. Um, now, when we name these areas, we can name the gaps and then the myelinated areas. Um, the gap is called a node. Okay, or if you wanted to be very specific, you could say a node of Ranvier, R-A-N-V-I-E-R, -E node of, or I think it's probably pronounced Ranvier, I don't know, um, but we can call it a node. So the answer to this question would be node, or I could point right here, that would also be a node. Um, if I asked you for the other area, right, so if I like asked you for this area, that is myelinated, that would be internode. See, so the nodes are the areas that are not myelinated, where there's a little gap, and then the internode is the area that is myelinated. This is showing us the spinal cord, and there are a lot of different structures, a lot of different questions that are going to be on the spinal cord. Um, something that's going to be very important is for you to be able to distinguish the back from the front, right? So posterior and anterior, because all of the stuff or a lot of the things that we label um, like the gray horns, the white columns, the nerve roots, they're anterior and posterior versions. So you've got to be able to look at this and say, you know, which part's the front, which part's the back. And there are multiple different hints or multiple different things you can look at to figure that out. Okay. Um, so let's first get our bearings, what we're looking at. Here in the very middle, this is the spinal cord. Hey, your spinal cord that goes all the way up and down your spine, right? Your back. Um, then we have our meninges, right? Spinal meninges all out here, right? And the spaces kind of surrounding the spinal cord. On the sides, see these yellow things on the sides? Those are the nerves, okay? Which are just axons, bundles of axons that are leaving the spinal cord. All of this here that you see surrounding the spinal cord, those are the vertebrae. Hey, remember your vertebrae line up to form your spine and the whole point of them is that the spinal cord goes down the center. So they surround and protect the spinal cord. So you're looking at a vertebra that's surrounding the spinal cord. The vertebra is one of the things that can you can look at it to tell front from back. Remember that your vertebrae have a body, right? This is the body of the vertebra. And then in the back, they have a spinous process. And I'm not going to ask you to identify these things on the exam. That was back in the skeletal exam. Um, but hopefully you remember these things. And that, again, is what's going to help you figure out back from front, right, or posterior and anterior. Remember this spinous process, right, this process that sticks out like that, that goes towards the back. 
that's what you feel when you bend over and you feel all those little bumps sticking out on your back from your spine, you're feeling the spinous processes. So when I look at this, right, I can look at the bone, the vertebra that's surrounding the spinal cord, and that tells me that this is posterior and this is anterior. That's going to be very important. The other thing that will tell you is if you look at the nerve roots, right? So looking at the spinal cord, the little yellow lines or wires that come off are nerves. So there's a nerve root right here coming from the front of the spinal cord. And there's one back here coming from the back of the spinal cord. Only the posterior root only the one in the back has this big swollen ball. Okay, that's a ganglion. So it's another little mass of neuron cell bodies. So there's neurons here in the spinal cord, and then the axon stretches out to this, and then there's another neuron here in that bulge, and then the axon will stretch out. That does not happen in the front. So the anterior nerve doesn't have that bulge. The anterior one just continues like that with no second neuron, okay? So if you see, if you look at wherever this bulge is and you follow it, that's bringing you to the back or the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. Um, speaking of the bulge or the ganglion, that's what this question is asking you for. Identify the structure at the tip of the arrow. Um, it's asking for this bulge right here. That is the posterior root ganglion. Hey, the posterior root ganglion. This is that same exact model it's just zoomed in, right? It's just closer so that we can see the spinal cord better. Um, again, you still see the, the body of the vertebra right here. So I know that that's anterior and you can kind of see the start of a spinous process. So I know that that is posterior. You can also even see where this nerve root starts to get bigger and bigger, whereas the one in the front doesn't. Okay, so you can see the ganglion start to form. So that's posterior. This is a big problem that students have. Okay, very frequently they get frustrated and they say, you know, I couldn't tell front from back in that picture. Um, but you can, 100%, you can very easily tell front from back if you understand what you're looking at. Okay, all right. So um, <clears throat> identify the structure or passageway at the tip of the arrow, passageway. That tells me I'm, I'm identifying some sort of an opening, right? Um, this little hole, the little black dot in the very middle at the tip of this arrow, that little hole is pointing to the central canal. The central canal. The central canal runs all the way up the entire spinal cord. Um, it actually connects to the ventricles of the brain. So remember we said cerebrospinal fluid or CSF flows through those ventricles in the brain. And then after the fourth ventricle, it goes down into the central canal. They're connected and it just flows through the central canal. So this is a little canal, a little hole that runs down the center of the spinal cord. Um, this is just a, a little bit um, outside of the central canal. This is pointing to this whole structure right here that connects the two sides um, of the spinal cord. In general, when we're looking at the spinal cord, we have gray matter and white matter. Same as in the brain, right? There's gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is where the neuron cell body is. The white matter is where there's a lot of axons. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the spinal cord, the gray matter is on the inside. It's deeper. And the white matter is superficial. It's on the outside. 
So in general, all of this out here on the outside, that's all white matter. And then this butterfly shape that you see on the inside, that's the gray matter. Okay. This question again is pointing to this area here that connects the two wings of the butterfly right it connects the two sides of gray matter we call this the gray commissure okay, the gray commissure gray because it's gray matter and gray can be spelled with an a or an e either one is fine it's kind of one of those weird words you can spell it either way um, but gray, because it's gray matter, commissure, it communicates or connects the two sides. Okay, so central canal was the dot in the very middle. Gray commissure is this gray matter that connects the two sides. This is pointing to another part of the gray matter. So the gray matter on either side can be divided into a... Um, a posterior horn, a lateral horn, and an anterior horn. And these areas are important because they're functionally distinct. They all have their own specific function. So, um, for example, neurons that control movement, so um, motor neurons, are located in the anterior horn. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, and then sensory neurons are located in the posterior horn. So it's they're, they're functionally and anatomically distinct from each other. So again, you guys need to be able to tell anterior and posterior. Remember that where this big round body is, that's anterior, and where the spinous process is, that's posterior. When we look at the gray matter, there's like this little part that goes towards the front, there's this part that goes towards the side, and then there's this part that goes towards the back. This arrow is pointing towards the part that goes towards the back. So this is the posterior posterior gray horn. posterior gray horn. It's the little horn, right, the little part that sticks out um, of gray matter in the back. Okay. Same thing, right, except for now we're on the side. So this area here that's towards the side is lateral. Right? That's literally what lateral means. Medial is towards the middle, lateral is towards the side. So this is a lateral gray horn hopefully you can answer this really quickly on your own this is another gray horn but this one's in the front okay how do i know it's the front i know it's the front because this is the vertebral body which is the anterior part of the vertebra so this answer would be anterior gray horn now this is pointing to the white matter okay again on the outside of the spinal cord all around the outside is white matter where we primarily have axons um and we name this area as well for anterior right in the front lateral on the side and posterior in the back these are called funiculi. Um, funiculi is plural. Funiculus is singular. So this is the anterior funiculus. Funiculus. The anterior funiculus. Um, they're also called columns. So um, like white column. So in some sources you would see anterior white column. Anterior funiculus is also correct. This is just the side. So this would be the lateral funiculus. And then this is the one going towards the 
back. Okay, again, I know it's the back because that's where the spinous process of the vertebra is. Um, I also know it's the back because if I look at this root over here, it has the ganglia, and that's only in the back. So this would be the posterior funiculus or the posterior white column. When you look at the spinal cord, there are a couple grooves that are present, just like in the brain, right? Remember in the brain, there are all of those sulci, the little, um, little grooves, and then there are some really deep grooves that we call fissures. There are a couple grooves that are present in the spinal cord as well. Um, there's one in the front right here, and then there's one in the back as well. Um, you'll notice the one in the front is deeper and more prominent. And I think this picture shows that pretty well, right? Like this groove right here looks like it's a deeper, more prominent groove than the one in the back. Um, <clears throat> so we name these based on their location and whether it's a sulcus or a fissure. This is pointing to the one in the back. Um, and this is called, this little groove in the back is called the posterior, because it's in the back median, because it's median, right, it's in the middle, solstice. The posterior median solstice. I could also ask you for the one in the front. Um, again, this is a bit deeper of a groove and it's located anteriorly. So this groove is, and again, look at the question. Like you might say, the arrow is, well, the arrow is also pointing to the pia mater. The pia mater is this layer that's on the surface of the spinal cord. So, yeah, it is pointing to the pia mater as well. But if you look at the question, the question says identify the groove at the tip of the arrow. Okay, so you've got to be really careful to read the question and actually answer what it's asking you. So this is, this groove is the anterior Median, because it's in the middle. Fissure, because it's a pretty deep, prominent groove. So the anterior median fissure. It's kind of obvious on this one which one's bigger, um, but the way I remember that is um, anterior median fissure and then posterior median solstice. Posterior and solstice go together, right? And that's PS. Like when you're writing a letter and you're like, hey, PS, blah, blah, blah. Um, PS, so posterior solstice. PF doesn't go together, right? Posterior and fissure don't go together. They don't make sense. Speaking of the PIA matter, um, <clears throat> surrounding the spinal cord, we already took care of really the whole spinal cord, right? Everything in it we've identified. But surrounding the spinal cord, there are layers of membranes that protect the spinal cord and help to anchor it in place. Um, just like in the brain, right? In the brain, we have cranial meninges. Well, those meninges are continuous. They continue down to surround the spinal cord, and those are the spinal meninges. Um, in the brain, they had three layers. In the spinal cord, they have three layers. Um, the meninges are very similar in the brain and in the spinal cord. The major difference is that in the spinal cord, we have an epidural space. There's space that's filled with fat between the dura mater and the bone. There's no space in the brain. In the brain, remember that the dura mater is fused to the skull. It's actually attached to the skull. Um, <clears throat> but in the spinal cord, there's epidural space. That's where we place an epidural like when you're having, uh, when you need anesthesia, when you're having a baby and you get an epidural, that's where they place it. They put the needle um, or the catheter rather, like a flexible tube into the epidural space. And that's where the drug is given to numb all of the nerves in that area. Um, but anyway, sorry, I digress. So there are spinal meninges and there are three layers of them. Um, the inner layer is the pia matter. And then we have the arachnoid matter. And then we have the dura matter, okay? So three layers. This is pointing to the inner layer, 
this is the layer that's right on the surface of the spinal cord. Okay, there's only one layer that's on the surface of the spinal cord um, or the surface of the brain. Um, identify the layer at the tip of the arrow. And then again, just to be clear, I'm saying the white line. Um, that's the innermost layer, which is the pia matter. Okay, pia matter. That's a really delicate um, layer. There are spaces that are involved as well. So we'll see like a layer of the meninges, then a space, then a layer of the meninges, then a space, then a layer of the meninges, then a space. Okay, so we have to name the spaces, um, which we'll get to in a second, and the layers. Um, this is showing us the middle layer. So identify the layer at the tip of the arrow, the gray line. We looked at the pia matter on the surface and then we saw a space. And then this is showing us the next gray line, okay, or this, the middle membrane. And that middle membrane is the arachnoid. And matter, the arachnoid matter. Then this is showing us the outer membrane. So identify the layer, okay, so not a space, I'm telling you, layer, at the tip of the arrow, again, the gray line. So this outer gray line here, this outer area is the dura matter, which dura matter literally means tough mother. Um, this is a really strong outer layer. So this was the dura matter. The, uh, the gray line inside it was the arachnoid matter, and then the white line on the surface was the pia matter. Now we have the spaces. Um, this space right here, it's actually a rather large space that goes all around the spinal cord in here. That's the space that's between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. Right, because remember, the pia matter is directly on the surface of the spinal cord. And then you have this space, and then outside that, we have this arachnoid matter. All of this space here is the space underneath the arachnoid matter. So it's called the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space because it's beneath it's sub the arachnoid matter and again the question tells you what I want identify the area at the tip of the arrow the open area that open space subarachnoid space this is where um, cerebral spinal fluid or CSF flows around the outside of the spinal cord because remember that cerebral spinal fluid is made in the ventricles of the brain it flows through the ventricles, it flows through the central canal of the spinal cord, and then it also flows around the outside of the spinal cord and the outside of the brain. The way that it does that is by flowing through the subarachnoid space. So it's not actually empty, um, there's CSF in it. Um, <clears throat> this is another space, right? So identify the area at the tip of the arrow, the yellow area. Um, the reason it's yellow is because there's fat there. There's a lot of fat and then um, vessels that are present, veins that are present. This is the space that's on top of the dura matter. Remember that the outer layer was right here, and that was the dura matter. This is the space on top of it. So this is the epidural space. <clears throat> the epidural space. There's also subdural space. Um, this tiny, tiny little um, open space between the two gray lines, that's the space beneath the dura matter. So that's subdural space. Um, but epi, epi means upon. So the epidural space is the space that sits upon the dura matter, outside of the dura matter.
<clears throat> this is another model of the spinal cord and the nerves. Um, <clears throat> this one might be a little bit more challenging for you because it does not have the vertebra around it. You don't have the bones there to help you figure out front and back. Um, you do have a couple other things though that will help you figure it out. Uh, one is this right here. Remember that's the posterior root ganglion. Um, and the ganglion, that swollen ganglia is only in the back. So that tells me that this back here is posterior and the other side here is anterior. So don't get confused. This is in an opposite direction as the other pictures. The other pictures we were looking at were oriented the other way. So don't just assume, you know, front and back. You've got to look at it and figure out which is the front, which is the back. Also, when you look at it, there's this really deep groove here. That's the fissure, the fissures in the front. And in the back, it's not as deep. That's the solstice. And we know that PS, posterior, is where the solstice is. But I think that this ganglion is the easiest way to say, okay, that's the back. Um, <clears throat> so now that we know front and back, we can look at what's this actually asking for. Hey, the structure at the tip of the arrow. Um, again, I know that it's not blue, it's green. <laughs> this is pointing to this um, nerve root. Okay, so this is the anterior nerve root. There are actually all of these like little tiny wires that you see coming off the spinal cord. Those are rootlets, okay, little tiny rootlets. And then those come together to form the root. So the anterior root and the posterior root. And then those come together and that gives us the spinal nerve. So like this at the end, that's the spinal nerve that exits the spinal cord through the interventricular foramina. Um, identify the structure at the tip of the arrow. Um, this is just the, uh, the opposite side, right? So instead of in the front, this is in the back. So that's the posterior nerve root. If I were pointing to this bulge, that would be the ganglion, okay? But it's not, it's not pointing to the bulge. It's pointing to the actual nerve itself. Okay, so this is changing gears quite a bit um, and going to the brain. What we're looking at here is the superior view or the top view of the cerebrum. Remember the brain has multiple regions. The cerebrum is this large top part. And then in the back, we have the cerebellum. And then in the middle, we have the diencephalon and the brainstem. We're looking at the top of the cerebrum. You'll notice that the cerebrum is separated into two halves or hemispheres, right? There's the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, cerebral hemispheres. This question is asking you to identify the groove at the tip of the arrow. This groove right here, it's a very deep groove that goes down in between the two hemispheres. This is called the longitudinal fissure. Okay, the longitudinal fissure. It goes longitudinally and it's a really deep fissure that separates the, the cerebrum into two hemispheres. Identify the groove at the tip of the arrow. Um, this is pointing to another groove. It's not as deep, but here in the center of the cerebrum, we have a groove that goes transverse, right? It goes like horizontally across the cerebrum. And this is a, it's pretty prominent. And this is an important one. It separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And it separates like sensory areas from motor areas. Um, but the groove itself is called the central solstice. 
Okay, the central solstice. That's important um, because we name a couple other things based off the central solstice. Um, for example, in a second, we'll see that this gyrus, this raised area in front, is the pre-central gyrus. And then this gyrus in the back of it is the post-central gyrus. Um, so that central solstice is pretty, pretty important to remember. Identify the groove at the tip of the arrow. Um, this is driving me insane that it says blue. Uh, this is looking at the side of the brain, right? You can see the cerebrum up top on the bottom back here. You can see the cerebellum, and then you can kind of see the brain stem sticking out at the bottom. So we're looking at the side, um, and this groove right here is called the lateral um, so if you look at different texts this is named differently um, this is the lateral solstice or in some texts you'll see lateral fissure I'm okay with either one um, if you call it a, a fissure or a solstice it's okay um, but lateral because it's lateral right it's on the sides um, it separates the temporal lobe which the temporal lobe is down here from the frontal and parietal lobes. But the answer to this, because it's asking for the groove, the answer would be lateral solstice or lateral fissure. Okay, now something really quick. This next one says, identify the region at the tip of the arrow, not the functional area. This gets confusing for students, and um, I want to warn you, like, make sure you look at the question carefully and answer it appropriately, because there are parts of the brain that have an anatomical name, and they have a functional name. So the anatomical name is just like the, the physical area, that spot. The functional area is what it actually does. So again, pay attention to the question. Um, this is the gyrus right in front of the central solstice. Remember, a solstice is a groove and a gyrus is a the raised area, right? So like this is a gyrus, this is a gyrus, this is a gyrus. All of the raised areas that are in between the solstice, those are gyri. Um, gyri is plural, gyrus is singular. So when you look at this question, um, remember we said that this groove right here was the central solstice. This question is asking for the gyrus that's right in front of it, this raised area that's just in front of that solstice. So it is the pre-central gyrus. Pre-central it's in front of the central solstice, pre-central gyrus. Um, front and back, guys, The I know that because um, the cerebellum, this little structure down here, that's in the back of the brain. Okay, so the back of the brain also kind of goes down lower um, and the front of the brain ends a little higher. But, so I know that this is in front of the, the central solstice, it's not behind it. Okay, so pre-central gyrus. This is the opposite side, right? Identify the region at the tip of the arrow, not the functional area. Um, again, the central solstice is this groove in the middle. The gyrus that's right behind it, so this area that's colored dark purple, is called the post-central gyrus. Identify this lobe of the brain that is circled. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see multiple different models of the brain. You'll notice the last one was colored. This one is not. Um, when I'm asking you for more specific little structures, I'll, I typically will use the colored brain because it's, it's just easier for you guys at this point. It, it allows you to kind of see the different areas better, whereas this would be harder for you guys. So for example, like on this picture, the central solstice is right here. 
but I think that would be harder for you guys to pick out um, because it's not color coded and you're just not that used to it. So, um, <clears throat> uh, but I will use brains like this. I will use brains that are not color coded, um, but in this case, it's asking for the lobe and that's pretty easy to identify. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just to get your bearings, remember that this is anterior, that's the front of the brain, and then back here, that's posterior, that's the back of the brain. I know that because the cerebellum, this little walnut looking thing, is in the back. So I'm asking for the lobe, okay, lobe is anatomical, uh, that's here in the front of the brain. In the front of the brain, everything in front of the central solstice is the frontal lobe. Now again, don't give me a functional area. I'm not asking you for a functional area. I'm asking you for the lobe of the brain. Uh, the brain is divided up into different lobes. The frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and then the insula. Um, you'll notice that these lobes follow the bones, right? So if you learned the bones of the skull, you learned the frontal bone, parietal bones, occipital bone, and temporal bone. Um, the lobes are just right underneath those bones. So the answer here would be the frontal lobe. Identify the lobe of the brain. Again, lobe, so not a functional area. Um, this is lateral, right? So this is like on the side. It's the area just underneath the lateral solstice or the lateral fissure. Um, it would be right about here. That's the temporal region, the temporal bone, and the part of the brain is the temporal lobe. So frontal lobe in the front, temporal lobe on the side. Um, identify the lobe of the brain um, that's circled. This is just the area behind the central solstice. Okay? So the area just behind the central solstice is the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe. Identify the lobe at the tip of the arrow. Um, <clears throat> to look at this again, the front is here, the back is over here. So we're pointing to the lobe that's at the very back of the brain. Um, remember, this is your occipital bone back here. Okay, that's the occipital lobe. Occipital lobe. Identify the structure at the tip of the arrow. And then again, I tell you, the entire area. So don't tell me, you know, folia. These little folds that you see are called folia. Don't tell me that. Like, I'm asking you for this whole structure. So what is the name of that entire structure? That is the cerebellum. The cerebellum. Remember, the whole big area up top is the cerebrum, and then this area at the bottom that's indicated is the cerebellum. The folds. <laughs> Identify the folds at the tip of the arrow. Um, the cerebellum is highly folded, right, just like the brain is, the or just like the cerebrum. The cerebrum has folds to increase surface area. Same thing with the cerebellum. The folds increase the surface area, which increases the amount of neurons that you can have present in that little structure. Um, when we looked at the cerebrum up here, we said the grooves were sulci, right? That's plural, sulci. And we said the raised areas were gyri. When we look at the cerebellum, it's a little bit more uniform, um, and the folds in the cerebellum are called folia. Those are folia. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here because um, it's getting kind of long.
uh, I'll stop this video here and then I'll go ahead and open or upload a part two after this.